Okay, so this is the last um, informatics department seminar of the year. Um, and I think we saved the best for last. Um, it is not, however, the last talk of the year. So I will take the fact that I'm standing here to point out to you that on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, um, in Fifty Eleven, um, we have a talk from Christian Sandvig, who's going to talk, amongst other things, about how why he had to sue the US government so that he and you could do research on algorithm bias. Um, and so it's a fascinating story. And how, you know, the, not the things I think as academics we expect ourselves to be doing, but Christian has done us all enormous service to this. So, so he's going to talk about that. And for the students, he's also going to have a, a, a master class on methods in the afternoon at two o'clock. If you want to know more about that, let me know. It's open to, open to anyone. Um, but first, uh, we will have today's speaker, and I am really delighted to be able to introduce Lisa and to have Lisa here for this talk. Um, so Lisa Nakamura is the Gwendolyn Calvert Baker Collegiate Professor um, at at the University of Michigan, where she has so many appointments that I had to write them down. It's one of the reasons I'm using, using my computer. She's appointed in the Department of American Culture, the Department of Asia Pacific American Studies, the Department of Women's Studies, the Department of English, as well as being in her copious spare time, um, the director of the Digital Studies Institute. So, as many of you know, Lisa's uh, work first on race and ethnicity on the internet. Um, and then many other things since then. But her, her work has really been foundational and opened up the opportunity to bring sort of critical uh, humanistic perspectives to internet studies and really sort of created or helped create the, the area of internet studies and critical digital studies. Um, if Lisa hadn't done that work, I'm not sure that in fact many others of us would be doing that. So it was a really sort of heartbreaking um, in an incredibly productive and, um, and generative way. Um, and recently, um, Lisa has been doing opening up uh, um, similar kinds of questions in the areas of virtual reality and metaverse, which is what she's going to talk about. And you'd much rather have your first talk about it than me. <laughs> so, Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Paul. I am so thrilled to be here among all of these distinguished colleagues, some of whom are from the early days of internet and other places and other times. And it's a real honor, um, certainly during your worst time of the year <laughs> to see so many people here. Um, I'm gonna present Work in Progress. It's a chapter, a chapter from a new book I'm writing called Digital Racial Capitalism, Women of Color and Digital Labor. Um, this book uh, is built upon an article I wrote some time ago about indigenous women and their labor manufacturing semiconductors and circuits from 1965 to 1975 on Navajo land. Um, I'm taking that idea, which is that women's work with their hands um, has been put into the service of the digital economy, but that from its beginnings, it was always viewed as free and creative as both gendered and racialized. So the work that was done to build circuits for Fairchild Semiconductor, which if you don't know, Fairchild is really the originary Silicon Valley company that spawned Intel and all the other um, kind of hardware companies. Uh, these women worked for 10 years building semiconductors in um, New Mexico, and they were paid far below minimum wage because there was a double bind of being internally colonized on the Navajo reservation. They were not able to be protected by labor laws, but very interestingly, because it was handwork and done to very high specifications for the military, because you can't make um, uh, munitions and weapons outside of the US, it's a law, but you wanted to make them cheaply, um, indigenous women were viewed as craftswomen, as um, operating to fulfill creative needs and the gender desire to make things with their hands. So that idea that women's labor and racialized labor has been interpolated as free labor because it's given from these essentialized qualities informs some of the future chapters I have in this book. Um, in this book, I'm focusing on reparative and restorative models for addressing online abuse in the pre-mobile web as well as the social media period. Um, the first two chapters go from 1965 to around 2012. Um, and the second to pick up from the post 2020 period when TikTok and Facebook in particular were used to document public racism by Gen Z women. 
um, specifically anti-Asian racism in the wake of COVID. And I have an article forthcoming with Wendy Chun and Grace Hong on anti-Asian racism and social media after COVID and um, techniques of measuring sentiment. So sentiment against Asian American women um, and the origins of sentiment analysis in internment camps. So watch that space. It's a pretty cool article, I have to say. Um, so what is digital racial capitalism and what's interesting about it? Um, I, oh, in fact, uh, the camera's on for, so for the folks on Zoom. Oh, okay, sorry. I haven't done this in a really long time, maybe three years. <laughs> so um, what I'm interested in is a broader theoretical claim that recognizing and rewarding this labor of love that women of color provide in the digital economy has the potential to unravel some parts of digital racial capitalism. So I'm defining digital racial capitalism as follows. Um, capitalism reserves wealth for specific types of people by excluding many forms of labor and the value they produce from the category of work. So this is totally unoriginal, right? This is Cedric Williams, sorry, Cedric Robinson. I'm writing about racial um, capitalism. So what kind of work is excluded on the basis of gender and race from the digital economy, reproductive labor, the labor of making platforms fun, safe, and easy to use. Um, as Robinson says, unfree labor is the basis of racial capitalism. So he's talking about slave labor, coolie labor, indentured labor, racialized labor, obviously, and gendered labor. Um, digital racial capitalism is founded upon the labor of BIPOC people and women especially and the ways they are excluded from capital accumulation in the digital economy, which is why I'm interested in it. In 2017, BBC, Ma BBC Magazine published an article, The Virtual Reality That Turns You Into a Black Woman. It's a feature story that described the work of Hyphen Labs, a transnational woman of color digital art collective founded in 2014 by Eke Tankal and Carmen Wedgie Aguilar, who I got to interview right before the pandemic. So that was great. Um, their virtual reality piece, Neurospeculative Afrofeminism, and here's a screenshot from it. Um, and here's another screenshot from it. I'll show you. Oh, no, that's sorry. I'm sorry. This is the video. Um, won a bunch of awards. It was featured at South by Southwest. It won an award in Tribeca Film Festival's immersive category and was distributed on now Meta's, uh, used to be Facebook's Oculus store. So the subtitle here is, why did design collective Hyphen Labs create a virtual reality experience populated exclusively by, by black women? Um, so this piece, which was developed for the Rift platform invites the user to put on a headset which transports them to a futuristic hair salon, which I'm just gonna show you a clip from. doesn't turn you into a black woman. <laughs> you might have noticed none of us are black women now um, as a result of watching this video. And oh, sorry. So here's Hyphen Labs' splash page describing who they are and what they do. Um, virtual reality embodies the paradoxes of digital racial capitalism. On the one hand, it's a platform where default whiteness is so much the norm that the subtitle for this story is that it's the world, you know, how we, how can we have a VR experience populated exclusively by black women as if having one ex exclusively with white people is not, you know, is also the norm. Um, at the same time, it's a platform where, um, uh, at the same time, VR makes some unique claims to bridge and eliminate racial, gendered, and disability related divides. And this became very intense during its rebooting and rebranding when Oculus bought Facebook, sorry, when Facebook was bought by Oculus in 2014, 
the release of the Rift headset in 2016, the increased use of embodied virtual interaction for DEI by companies like Mersion, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, post 2020 to meet the increased demand for diversity work in the tech industry, particularly, and the rebranding of Facebook as Meta in 2021. Yet at the same time, there is strong skepticism that VR will ever be anything but a niche platform, always on the verge of becoming a mundane technology. So I'm really interested in how many technology become mundane, right? Um, David Nemmer's work on digital favelas is all about the mundane and how we overlook it. But I'm also interested in those which resist mundanity, no matter how long they are around and how many, I mean, it's 20 years now and, and still um, VR is, is, never not, is never mundane. Um, high profile VR titles like Clouds Over Sidra, which is um, Chris Milk's uh, work, which he calls an empathy machine. Um, New York Times had a lot of, uh, in 2014, a lot of content about refugees that came with the mass mailing of the Google VR cardboard viewer that everybody received in the mail. Does everybody remember getting the Google cardboard in the mail? Did you throw it away or did you keep it? about a week, <laughs> somewhere between throwing it away and keeping it. Um, yeah, I think people just didn't know why they were getting this. And so what the Times was doing is bundling it with virtual empathy content about refugees to tell you why you needed it, right? It was trying to make an argument for its virtuous capacity as opposed to saying this is another toy that doesn't work very well, right? Um, so it was viewed as a direct response to institutional, interpersonal, and state-sanctioned violence against refugees and people of color. When I interviewed three Hyphen Lab members in 2018, I asked them why they thought the BBC insisted that what they were doing was turning users into Black women by having a Black um, uh, environment, an Afro-feminist Afro environment, uh, when cross-racial and cross-gender avatar embodiment is so far from new. So this has been part of video games for a long time. So why is it in VR now? It's magical and it turns you into something else. Um, games like Tomb Raider and The Last of Us have put users into bodies that are racialized and gendered differently from their own, yet these media didn't make headlines for turning you into those things. Carmen noted that the BBC title was a real oversimplification of the project, and she said it was clickbait, but that it also was taking, a taking advantage of the renewed interest in VR. Um, what Ashley said was, quote, we're simply trying to change the perspective of people that engage with Black narratives and Black women. Negative portrayals dominate media discussion, especially around violence committed on Black male bodies. And we thought, what about Black women? We wanted to place Black women in positions of power. Carmen, Ashley, and Eke do not describe their work creating Black women's virtual environments as doing racial empathy work. Instead, they told me they did it because they, quote, had no choice. This is our job, and this is our work. Our work is self-empowering, and that is important. They have paying jobs as consultants, designers, and software engineers, which underwrites Hyphen Labs a project they describe as, quote, a structure of support for other people coming up. And the members are women of color, transnational women of color. Um, their identity is women of color creating, quote, speculative design and speculative neuroscience is designed to participate, broaden participation in digital platforms, um, which is exactly the kind of diversity work that post-2020 institutions claim they want to sustain. But because this is created by women of color working outside of racial digital capital, not for pay, um, not as part of the official diversity um, economy, um, the mechanisms by which racial and gender hierarchies result in women of color not being given credit and not being compensated because the work is seen as natural, as quote, their choice, um, is motivated by racial traits like love, um, the desire to help um, and to empower. It's not read as labor. It is precisely because Black women's virtual environments are in and of themselves without any content other than what you saw, challenging for many white users that actually stop reading the comments on the BBC News article. So, you know, they take down comment sections after a while, and she said they were so violent that she found it really depressing. As she put it, the mere presence of the word Black triggered readers. And when the lab gave presentations of their work, a lot of audiences would interrupt them saying, why is this necessary? or asserting that racism is only applicable to Black people in the United States. And the Oculus Store reviews of the piece were really horrible, really bad and toxic. 
Um, Afro-optimist work like NSAF, which Ashley told me is neurospeculative Afrofeminism, but also not safe AF. <laughs> um, digital artist Stephanie Dinkins' immersive video piece, Secret Garden, Our Stories, Our Algorithms, avoid representations of racial violence against Black bodies, of artificial empathy and intimacy, turning you into something else, um, understanding the racialized point of view, um, and the off-criticized claims from VR companies to put you in someone else's shoes, um, to address racist thinking by appealing to the emotional side of your brain. In the words of Mersden, an educational simulation company in 2014, which was the same year Facebook acquired Oculus. So there's a lot of stuff going on in 2014. Um, like many corporate training companies, they pivoted to DEI offerings after 2020, when the death of George Floyd, among other things, prompted the NASDAQ to publicly, disclose, um, to publicly disclose diversity metrics. Um, Mersden raised $35 million in outside investment, employed 95 full-time people, and 85 part-time simulation specialists. And these are part-time actors paid by the hour to voice diverse avatars that can help users practice, identify microaggressions, discrimination against autistic people and women and black people. And herein lies the controversy, most of the actors are white. So some of you might've heard about this going on um, and I'll show you a clip. Hi, Linda, thanks so much for coming in today. How are you doing? This feels really unfair to me. I feel like Steve wants me to be like, all nice and smiley because I'm a woman. This feels unfair to me because of my gender. You obviously don't feel like things went very well. I'd like to hear more about why you think that is. The future of all of us depends on working together and understanding each other. These are the skills that make us human and we are wired for them. When we see the world from another's perspective and in so doing feel what they feel, we truly grow as human beings. Here at Mersion, we believe the essential skills that guide us through conflict and stressful situations can be learned, developed, and perfected. With immersive VR simulations, it's now possible to deliver intelligent training in soft skills at scale. At Mersion, we have a very unique approach to delivering these simulations. We combine the best parts of artificial intelligence and we kind of overcome the limitations that AI has by leveraging human reasoning. We're probably one of the only companies that's merging human performance with artificially intelligent driven avatars. In the immersive environment, you as a learner really engage and immerse yourself in a way that you wouldn't in traditional content. It allows you to activate the emotional side of your brain as well as the cognitive side of your brain. And those two things together fuse together for a great learning experience. Okay, so you can see <laughs> the picture of the brain is meant to show us that this is a technology that reaches right into your body, bypassing thought um, to help you um, become a better person, to be more empathetic um, and to trigger what they're calling emotional responses as if racism were a problem of emotions or having the wrong kinds of emotions that can then be remedied by this technology. Um, did anybody see this commercial by any chance? No. <laughs> um, it was viewed by about a million people on YouTube, which means almost nothing, but they have a lot of training videos and a pretty active channel on YouTube where they show kind of the same version of the story over and over again. Um, but the controversy around- Hi, Linda, uh, thanks so much. About who's voicing um, these actors ended up on BuzzFeed, which is never what you want to happen, right? <laughs> and so the headline, this is blackface, white actors are playing black characters in virtual diversity, reality diversity training. Um, Mersion tells big corporate clients that his VR simulations will help teach racial sensitivity, but the actors playing as black characters are often white, came out just last year, 2021. Um, journalist Emily Baker White interviewed voice actors who worked at Mersion 
and wanted them to describe the conditions of their labor. And some of the people working here are women of color, but they are all precarious workers. They're not permanent employees. Um, they're voice actors who are, um, have very, they're called term limited workers. And when she asked them what it felt like to voice um, autistic characters, sometimes which involve quote, rocking and hand flapping, um, act, you know, uh, avatars that were black or avatars that were a different gender. And they have the voice filtering so you can't really tell who it is. Um, many of them describe the conditions of their work as uncomfortable because it asked them to mimic racial and other stereotypes because they witnessed the use of black racial slurs by other actors in the name of realism, but mostly because it just felt wrong. So I'd like to contrast that with the affective qualities of working to make diverse content for VR by some of the collectives I talk about. Now, I always think it's kind of cherry picking to oppose and compare and contrast things for industry versus things artists do, because artists can do whatever they want, right? You're always gonna find a cool example from an artist and industry is a lot more constrained. That's not why I'm comparing these. Um, I'm comparing them because I'm interested in the feelings of fit or comfort or affective or bodily um, uh, kind of sensation, right? Because VR is meant to be a sensational technology. It's meant to be felt in the body. I think people don't talk enough about what workers in VR feel like. I think they talk a lot about what users feel like or what they're supposed to feel like. So um, these voice actors really felt wrong doing this work, um, which has been called minstrel work. VR has long claimed to create privileged emotions like empathy and engagement qualities, which I think are associated with anti-racist change. Um, however, as black feminist theorists, Sibia Hartman, Courtney Baker, and Aisha Gaines put it, the desire to experience empathy for the sufferings of black people, while at the same time leaving structural racism in place, has long underwritten pleasurable forms of cultural appropriation and projection. So Sadia Hartman's work on slave narratives and how pleasurable it was um, for white readers to read about the horrors of slavery and feel like, well, now I understand because I, what if it were my child, right? What if it was me, you know? Um, so it encouraged uh, kind of place taking or putting yourself in someone else's place without needing anyone to actually do anything, right? So cultural appropriation and projection is in itself pleasurable, whether or not it leads to any kind of activity. So the repopularization of virtual reality lies in its new, and I would say now more needed claims to create racial empathy, immersion and embodiment to heal a divided world, a world where users after COVID are divided from exotic places and actual other people um, and divided within themselves along lines of race and racial conflict. VR, which is just one type of digital virtual technology that falls under the term metaverse. And Tom and I had a great conversation about metaverse. Why now, right? What is that we're doing? Who benefits again from resuscitating the metaverse after 1992 snow crash, right? Um, makes unique claims to immediacy and psychological intensity. Again, going right into the brain, right? Um, the terminology used by marketers, developers, and platforms hue to this logic they call their products experiences um, as opposed to content or films, as if the 360 degree visual field were itself a way to produce experience. Um, virtual reality titles like Nani de la Pena's One Dark Night, which I'll show you here, um, immerses viewers in racially violent scenarios like Trayvon Martin's killing. So this one, um, it's an animated VR thing that you, you use using the headset. And what's really disturbing about it is that it uses actual audio from the 911 call when Trayvon Martin is being shot. So you can hear gunshots, um, literally taking the viewer directly to the scene of the crime. So this was not only a signature experience, it was really unpleasant for a lot of Black viewers who watched this, who described the experience as triggering, but also as asking like, why would anyone want to do this? Whereas other viewers found it really moving and really illuminating. Um, so um, many described experiencing this in VR as re-traumatizing um, in the name of producing empathy for black suffering. So there isn't really, I think enough attention 
to who is consuming these experiences, right? Experiences um, and what it means to them. So um, I'm interested on the conditions of labor for women of color and workers laboring in the meta versus diversity space. And after COVID, everything is a diversity space online, right? Well, at the same time, people are um, experiencing new kinds of racism. And I wanna show you this real fast. I wrote this during COVID with two grad students because we were noticing that um, black academics were having their dissertation defenses invaded by Zoom bombers who were organizing on Discord and they would shout the N word during defenses. Um, there was a woman who was who, a black woman who did a support group for other black dissertators and they were Zoom bombed. That also appeared in Buzzfeed um, by people who were exchanging data for how to log on to these events using Discord. And so it was white supremacy, it was swastikas, it was all that. And it was enough to write a book about, honestly. And somewhat about COVID, interestingly. I mean, when we talk about the metaverse, we should talk about Zoom. You know, the way Stevenson described the metaverse was really more like Zoom. He said it was considered to be good enough that you could write a contract or enter into a business agreement on it. And that is what Zoom has become. Um, and it's also this, this problematic space. So, um, Right. So um, the work that uh, Dinkins and Hyphen Lab are doing is creating diverse space in VR, keeping in mind that this is discounted as work because it's freely produced um, and it provides nurturing and not traumatic spaces um, for Black bodies in VR. Their work challenges VR's identity as a space for identity tourism, which is immersion. Um, uh, immersion didn't used to be a DEI training space. It was actually for simulating um, classroom interactions for teachers. But after 2020, it began at, well, actually 2019, it began advertising itself as being about diversity and inclusion in specific. So it's about rehearsing racism and microaggressions and getting feedback on it. Um, so identity tourism, which is a term I coined in 1995, right? Um, occupying a racially marginalized digital body for the purposes of enjoying otherness and an artificial sense of understanding oppression is the form of artificial empathy, which this kind of technology is producing. Though I coined that term um, in the 90s to describe chat room users who deployed racist and sexist stereotyping and avatar creation, it actually hasn't ever really left. I'm kind of surprised. And it's returned instead as part of an industrial strategy to create diversity without diverse people, right? Because most of these workers are not actually members of these groups, they are just pretending to be. I'm gonna show two um, other texts uh, that are industrial narratives about what virtual reality is supposed to do. But first I wanted to show you this. This came out, um, I think 2016. And there were quite a few stories like this that kind of skipped right ahead to the embodiment part. Right, this game, um, The Circle, was actually never even made. So this game, which wasn't even made, became a headline because it said it helped me grasp the life of a transgender wheelchair. So when this trope is so strong that the game doesn't even have to exist for it to become a headline, <laughs> it kind of tells you something about the hopes, dreams, and anxieties of people around VR. Um, so let me show you this commercial from Oculus it's from 2018, and it's called Open Your Eyes. Open your eyes. You are a fisherman in the Pacific, a weaver in the Philippines, and a journalist on the front lines. You are a hunter, and you are the hunting. Your front row, backstage, and you're the one we came to see. You act with kindness, and you fight with courage. You swim the depths of the oceans and float the heights of the skies. You walk on top of the world. You watch the world fall. And you are someone else's world. You are with family. You are with friends. You are with ancestors. You are lost. You are found. You are tiny, and you are infinite. 
Live every story. Because when you learn to love a life different from your own, the world becomes a little closer. This kind of ad about digital utopianism is so, Miriam's laughing, because I think I've shown this in my lecture course that she helped me teach, is so typical of new technologies and what they're meant to do, which is to heal rifts between people along the axes of race, gender, and other uncomfortable categories. So unlike hyphen labs, which creates an environment with no people in it, right, except for people who are getting their hair done, like they're not beating drums as indigenous people or look like they're having a candlelight vigil, um, are an invitation to be in an environment where nothing bad is happening. Um, this kind of uh, environment, I think, is very different. Um, it offers comfort and experience without, again, um, any actual participation by people of color or women, just representations of them. So instead of the freely given labor art and VR, which um, I've talked about before, this is really about selling a new kind of device by saying it will give you new experiences. So why does it matter what it feels like to make the metaverse? Because the conditions of digital capital um, uh, capitalize on women of color's affectability, their ability to have feelings um, and unpaid work often as moderators. So you probably know Sarah Roberts work on moderation as a paid activity. It's like a sin eater activity. You're just seeing the worst of the web and having to deal with it. Um, working at Merged and having to pretend to be a black person or pretend to be an autistic person by flapping is also that kind of work, right? It's just the worst kind of psychological work because it makes people feel so bad. Um, and these are predominantly in the case of moderation, um, very, very badly paid work often by transnational women um, and work which is often itself harassing. You're dealing with other people's harassment, but you're also feeling harassed as well. Um, so creating women of color digital environments challenges the model that Oculus has, which routes value towards the holder of platform economies that recapitulate the form of US empire and white supremacy. Industry doesn't want women of color's diversity work. <laughs> they want this instead because of its strong critique of oppression and capitalism. Instead, it wants empathy towards suffering black bodies or picturesque indigenous people beating drums, which are not how most indigenous people I know really spend their time. Um, so the work that Facebook um, slash Meta does is the work of evasion. Um, but first I'm gonna show you a slide about, sorry about immersion and the way it represents itself as replacing human. Um, there is so much nuance to interpersonal communication, especially in stressful circumstances. Um, and immersion is often called in when a company is gonna get sued or thinks it might get sued for racial harassment or sexual harassment. Um, Co-founder and CEO Mark Atkinson said, at some point we may not need humans, but for the foreseeable future, we're depending on our simulation specialists deliver the cognition and empathy that AI can't do. So again, this is very gendered work. It's seen as feeling work. I'm delivering empathy. Um, there was an interesting thread on Twitter about what skill people thought programmers needed the most. So what would you think most people would say this is the skill that programmers need the most? If you had to guess. Coding. Coding? That was in there. Logic. Logic, wow, um, I forgot that was in there. Uh, it's, it's Not that I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Any other guesses? Which one? Communicating, close, very close. I think they were trying to get a skill they thought that programmers didn't already have. Yeah. Empathy. Empathy. Thousands of people said empathy, we need empathy, 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 um, because doing things wrong when you're designing software, designing environments is because you don't feel the right way, right? That if you were in someone else's shoes, you would automatically make things that didn't hurt people, right? Um, so I think empathy is so highly prized as the kind of affective labor, which programmers can't do themselves. 
um, the, it, the diversity industrial complex wants to automate empathy, right? To deliver these two things, as you were saying, logic, coding, and empathy um, that AI can do by people who are often precariously employed actors who then have to do this identity tourism work in the metaverse. Um, it reads the work of women of color voluntarily making environments that reflect their experiences and that feel comfortable as opposed to um, exploitative as noise rather than signal as not delivering these things uh, when it's really, I would claim the opposite. So let me talk a little bit about Toni Morrison who I feel like doesn't get enough play. Um, as she wrote in 1992, in matters of race, silence and evasion have historically ruled literary discourse. Evasion has fostered another substitute language in which the issues are encoded, foreclosing open debate. So to me, the way that virtual reality is represented as automating racial empathy is really an evasive maneuver. Right? It's evading what it would actually take to undermine digital racial capitalism or racial capitalism generally. And to show how that looks or what that looks like, um, this issue of evasion, I'm going to talk a little bit about why Facebook renamed itself Meta. So um, Facebook did this a couple years ago. They were under fire for spreading misinformation and other issues. They said the change is part of its, quote, bet on a next digital frontier called the Metaverse. And um, here's a pull quote from this article from the New York Times. The move punctuates how Mark Zuckerberg, the chief executive, plans to refocus his Silicon Valley company on what he sees as the next digital frontier, which is the unification of disparate digital worlds into something called the metaverse. At the same time, renaming Facebook may help distance the company from the social networking controversies it is facing, including how it is used to spread hate speech and misinformation. So the re kind of rebranding of the metaverse as automated affect and automated cognition and empathy really is opportune given, the, given how Facebook is trying to evade these controversies around spreading hate speech and misinformation. So to pivot to a complete 180, um, it makes no sense in terms of making money as we've seen. Facebook is not doing great. As meta, I don't believe they're gonna sell as many headsets as we have cell phones, for example. Um, but what it does do is this evasive maneuver of repositioning itself as instead an empathetic technology. So I'm going to have to truncate this a lot because it's a chapter and this is only a talk. Um, but this is all to say I really welcome your questions and comments. I'm really interested. Some of you are designers, I know, and game people. And um, I have so many questions myself, like why why don't people think about video games when they're talking about these things? Like there's a huge archive, much of it written by people in this room around cross-racial embodiment in games. Why, why this amnesia? Why this kind of evasion? But anyway, thank you for taking the time. Whoop, that slide didn't show up anywhere. Oh, okay, this is what I was gonna end with. Um, this is a, a comment from Ashil Mbembe about algorithmic culture. So as he says, markets themselves are increasingly turning into algorithmic structures. The only useful knowledge today is supposed to be algorithmic. Instead of actual human beings with body, history, and flesh, big data and statistical inferences are all that count. And both are mostly derived from computation. So to me, what's going on with cross-racial embodiment in VR is trying to say flesh, body, and history can be turned into big data and statistics and it can be automated or it can be bought very cheaply. Well, I have a concluding slide you can't see, but it says thank you. Okay. <laughs> One of the things that you were reminding me of as you were speaking is uh, Fred Bird and the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. the, 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 what he speaks of is a particular historical moment and a very different kind of immersion. But an immersion that was imagined to be inherently democratic and anti totalitarian. Mm -hmm. um, and you're telling a very different story, I think, here about what happens when that's being you know, drawn into. Capitalism, right, and drawn into sort of commercial 
And I'm sort of fascinated by that move. I mean, it may be that it was this was just always a ridiculously naive position that people held, um, you know, during that, that time of which you know Turner was writing. Or maybe this was always inherent in uh, inherent in that. Or maybe there's actually been some kind of like cultural shift mm -hmm. in how we think. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's to do with empathy. I mean, although when I think about it, empathy is part of what. Um, was going on in the democratic ground in that you know, exhibition that, that was built and sort of moved towards the world. So I wonder if you have any, I mean, as you say, these are the narratives of virtual reality are 20 or perhaps like 40 years old at this point. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you have any sense of what's behind this sort of shift in how it is that we you know, conceive of what immersion might be for us. That's such a great question. Um, as I was combing through, well, I'll talk to the mic. As I was combing through what immersion says about what it's doing, it talks about blending AI and human labor as a way to deliver diversity and empathy at scale. Yeah, I was like, I didn't know where they went by. Because I mean, they had everything in there. <laughs> I was just waiting for at scale, and sure enough. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, right? That it's able to. You know, take one actor who then can be in multiple scenarios, voicing different characters and different, you know, racialized groups, um, to provide that kind of affective surround. So, I, as I recall, Fred's book is kind of about the post-war desire for this kind of visual plenitude in this field, um, but it's about serving democracy where everybody can be equally seen and heard. And I think this is about doing something very undemocratic. Right, which is to take people and turn them into some mashup of real and unreal and then scale. So, you know, where democracy is about taking everybody and making them similar size in a way so that they can all fit in the same place and all be heard. This is about taking one person and making them into a lot of other people, mm -hmm. um, but people who are not them. So it's very anti democratic in a way. Um, as I was writing this, I thought about the current multiverse conversation, which is in the Spider-Man movie and in Doctor Strange and everything, everywhere, all, all at once. And this idea that scale can be pretty frightening sometimes that, you know, it can kind of proliferate in ways that, that kind of challenge coherence and synthesis altogether. Um, and this is kind of a terrible dystopian idea that if you don't have diversity, you don't want to pay for it, you can build it. Right? or it's too threatening, right? I think that's the other thing. Um, actual diversity is uncomfortable, whereas this is just kind of uncomfortable, you know? I mean, it's more uncomfortable for the workers than for anybody. Tom, were you gonna say something? Sure, thanks so much for that uh, talk. It's good to throw work spaghetti on the wall. Good. There's so much interesting stuff going on with that. But like, it seems like there's like three things going on at, at one particular good piece about what this stuff is supposed to do that is so interesting. So one of it is about the senses, right? Mm -hmm. like, that's such a focus of this VR stuff. And, you know, as we were talking about before this morning, like it's this misrecognition of sensory immersion versus social immersion. Mm -hmm. But also incredibly beautiful because it seems to be completely and it's also a tool that the diversity is something that can be sensed. It's like something that can be seen. Yeah. Right? So, like, this is an immediate spot in which you can hear the spot stuff because, like, what you can like your hands as they, you know, like how, how you represent sexuality or invisible disabilities in VR is itself interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So, you can see that diversity is something that the senses can act on. Yeah. Right? Which is, which is very interesting. And then, the, the, so that all that senses one, thing is one thing that's going on. And then second, all this wild stuff around empathy, and it's like you're saying, the way in which that becomes a substitute for like the structural things or whatever. But the third thing that to me, I'm still just, my head is spinning about it, is thinking about what this, it has to do with the idea of representation. Mm -hmm. And like thinking about <clears throat> your example of the, the trans wheelchair and the dog and other, and the, mm -hmm. the black folks, like, and make you think back to 1922 and Malinowski's idea around the native's point of view. Mm -hmm. like that like the goal of uh, ethnographic research is to stand in the place of another in a sense, the native's point of view, pushing back against like evolutionary kinds of anthropology that just wanted to create trends and food and didn't care about like the actual experience of everyday life, right? And there's been a lot of critique of that in anthropology and beyond, thinking about it was often white people representing mm -hmm. um, like folks in that history, not exclusively, but often. And all, also part of that 
critique has been nowadays that even if you are quote unquote from the culture that you're writing about, that doesn't give you an automatic auto ethnographic task to just that whatever you think is deep is automatically what is out there, right? Like it's not that simple either. So I, I like so many of these issues around standing in the place of mm -hmm. have such a long history even prior to DR that are about sort of representation and appropriation, which is a, a word you use. So I just some interesting spaghetti on the wall stuff. That mm -hmm. I yeah, I feel like the conversation around cultural and racial appropriation is made so literal here. And that's yeah. why it's useful as an example. If people don't really understand what that is, all you have to do is watch what's happening here and realize that this is it. Um, and I think your comment around the visible versus the invisible in terms of experience is really important here because this is not really VR in the sense that Oculus is talking about VR. It's just a chat room, mm -hmm. you know? It's like the palace, only a little less. I know, it's a little nicer, but it's not that much nicer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so again, like appropriating the metaverse as a culturally privileged term, this empathy writ large, like Oculus says it is, like they're taking that as opposed to gaming, which has a low social values still for a lot of people. They want to dis dissociate themselves from that. Um, but it's really a lot more like most video games in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think the literalness of having to make the vis invisible visible by overt performance, you know, like hand flapping is not really an autistic behavior for a lot of people, but you have to make everything move through the channel that, uh, that immersion has, which is a very limited channel. So you're creating new stereotypes as opposed to reducing the ones that already exist by having to make the you know, quali qualitative quantitative in a way. I mean, that's what Mbembe would say is that computational culture wants to make qualities into quantities because those can be stored, traded, bought, and sold in the kind of you know, world computer. It's a term that John Beller uses. So that's the kind of paradox of the diversity industrial complex, right? It has to reify the thing that it says it's trying to get rid of. Have the emerging people ever tried to do anything LGBTQ? Like, well, how would they do it? They do it by having somebody um, perform some kind of overt, you know, homophobic slur and then having someone react to it. So deeply triggering, again, for anybody who's ever witnessed or been, you know, so they're they're really reproducing the thing they say they don't want and having to do it twice as big in order to make it signify. Yeah. Yeah, this is wonderful thoughts. I love this question. Um, I guess my question is someone who really researched like VR and virtual world in the 90s, um, and they can see this thought that someone would think that it's in the I guess could you let some insight on some of the things you think have changed? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's two pieces of this talk, pre-2020 and post-2020. Because what's changed post-2020 is an, an incredible financial investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion at the institutional level. So the market for this is great. You know, Immersion has huge numbers of industrial partners who ever since this came out said, no, we don't work with them, but they do, right? Like there's lots of evidence that they were. Um, because the question is often, what are you doing to train your workers to be less you know, racist, sexist, and ableist? So if you buy something like this, you can say you're doing something. Just like if you subscribe to a wellness app for your, your staff who are having mental illness problems, it means that you don't have to change working conditions, right? So there's been a lot of investment, you know, I'm not gonna call it lip service, but investment in being able to say, this is what we are doing. And that's what immersion is really gaining from. Um, they were around before 2020, but they weren't doing this. They were doing different kinds of simulations, like how to fire someone, right? Or how to tell your student you're, they're failing your course. So they, they really pivoted a lot after George Floyd. Yeah. Um, this is for Tom. Well, this question about sexuality reminded me of this uh, YouTube documentary that I watched about VR chat. Oh. About like how these uh, teenagers were like figuring out about their own like sexuality and gender identity by essentially cosplaying as anime women in VR spaces. Mm. And like that sort of uh, 
as they were like alluding towards like a more decentralized democratic future of the US basis. But as like, you know, living in this dystopian reality where meta has uh the art of the no bottom house. Mm -hmm. It's kind of uh, starting to see how like thinking about these like democratized US spaces, like I sort of fear that those spaces will be eventually be swallowed by metas and the way uh giant corporations control it. Uh, uh I'm not sure your thoughts about like the the survival strategy of yeah. these smaller democratizing centers. Well, you're kind of getting it. You have the whole thesis of my book right there, right? <laughs> which is that, you know, there always have been spaces for genuine diversity that people are making, but because of who's making them, they're not given credit. In fact, they're often banned or suspended or otherwise suppressed, right? So, um, you know, I start my book off with a short story about Tila Tequila. I don't know if anyone remembers Tila Tequila. <laughs> you know, she was the biggest social media star like she had more followers than anybody when um myspace went online and she was kind of incentivized to go on myspace because she had all these followers on friendster but she also had her own followers and so people don't remember her even though she was one of the first people to use a music player on her side she claims that she was the first who knows if that's true <laughs> whatever um but there's always been innovation by women of color and by trans people and by other people who are not currently employed for money by Silicon Valley, but who benefit from these innovations, right? By the creation of this space. So um, I'm really invested in trying to understand how we could have a restorative or reparative digital economy by viewing that as labor and rewarding it, right? Either financially or in kind of intellectual terms and appreciating it. Um, because I think if we could do that, that would fix a lot of other problems, which have to do with like, this vast inequality, right? But also this um, culture of disrespect for that kind of activity, which is very productive, but kind of like housework isn't viewed as wage labor, right? Not as something people need to get paid for. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Thanks for very interesting and thoughtful. I mean, it's a quite simple question, I think. But um, I was just struck by this uh, point you said that empathy is uh, in the way that these developers, for instance, we talk about empathy as a way to make the right choice. Mm -hmm. So, this relation between empathy and action, for instance, I think is very interesting. Um, and it seems to me it's there in two levels. Like there is the one where we individualize work, and then there is the one for the, uh, the industrial complex. Um, and I was just wondering, like, do you know where does this come into the industrial complex? Because it seems that this ties into other ways of uh, creating the right choice for an ecological choice, or you know, the the abstract kind of idea that we need to keep humans all out of it. Mm -hmm. how, how does this suddenly come into this? Yeah. Yeah, well, the way that these technologies kind of talk about empathy is as a precognitive or non-cognitive activity, you know, that VR bypasses the brain, right? That it reaches right into your kind of feeling self so that you don't actually have to make a choice. It just happens. Like you would never say or do something racist presumably if you were in that body because it just wouldn't be possible, which is a misunderstanding, I think, of how racism and sexism work. Um, so there's this kind of spurious cognitive science going on here <laughs> around what racism is, right? And where it comes from and how to do something about it. So, you know, regardless of whether there's, and there probably is some kind of study around whether racial prejudice is reduced. I did find a study from Portugal that said that the implicit bias test people took after doing some of this VR as a black person, you know, actually made a difference, but those tests don't really have a lot to do with reality necessarily, right? Um, so I think it's, it's interesting that discourse that says it's not really about thinking and that technology can, can create the right response so that you won't have to think about it. Because if you think about it, you might not choose the right thing. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, in terms of work, um, 
great question. I think someone like Fox Harrell at MIT has been thinking about this for a long time, you know, creating um, different avatar choices and sets of, you know, resources that could acknowledge that a little better. Um, I start with the Hyphen Labs example because I think they do just an exemplary job. Like there isn't any, um, there isn't a sophisticated set of new things for bodies to do, but just the fact that you are in a space that was uh, that has black women's bodies like that's the headline right but it's also pretty rare in VR you know VR has been focused a lot on kind of um, people falling so there's a lot of VR clips of people falling and screaming or throwing up or falling down like it's kind of a spectacle of bodies being fooled and also bodies being harmed so people really hurting themselves a lot of times it's kind of painful to see actually so to create a nurturing space where no one's getting hurt and there's race at the same time is quite a revolutionary thing to do. And I think a, a response to this kind of um, voyeuristic and sadistic consumption of black pain after George Floyd, right? So that's the radical move from the point of view of that collective. Um, this work was made before 2020, but when I think about other work like Stephanie Dinkins's, which does similar things where there's black bodies and they're just telling stories. Right, and it, it is VR, they're moving around. Um, those are very simple things, but they're also very rare, actually. And I think they're important, so thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to build on the question that you asked about VR um, a little bit. And um, so during that Open Your Eyes, Ad, it reminded me of another video that you mm. played in your classes, which is from the 90s. Um, all these people are like, there's no race on these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in a weird way, I feel like you could write your early books and just change some of the words from the <laughs> VR. Yeah. Um, and thinking about like how all of that was happening around the cultural wars that were happening mm. in the US. So, I guess my question is, how are you framing like that big time gap within your book? Mm -hmm. And why do you think it's important to look at both of those time periods together? Very <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the claims are similar, really similar, right? About disembodiment and the sublime and you know. Um, so on, but I think the situation economically is so different. You know, in 1995, Amazon had not made a penny. It was still a profitless company. I mean, all the companies which now kind of own the economy, global economy, were small. And Facebook wasn't a mobile technology yet. You know, everything was still on the computer. So it, there wasn't this pervasiveness that Mbembe writes about as now being this whole logic. Um, John Beller has a great book called The World Computer. I don't think it's a great title. But it's about what he calls computational racial capitalism, which is related to what I'm talking about. He's not interested in women of color, right? Um, I am, because to me, that's the labor which makes digital racial capitalism. So I think that's the difference, is the whole center of gravity around money and capital and where and how it's made has completely changed since 2002 or whenever I wrote that. Um, and also some of the weird body claims around brains are different. You know, it was more about 
have this touristic, beautiful experience as if you were there. There was no picture of the brain. So there's this weird kind of hijacking of cognitive science, which wasn't a thing then. But yeah, it's a good question. It's You've also hit on a very well-worn academic strategy of publishing the same book with a few words. That's changed. right. <laughs> Lisa, of course, would not do that, but there's many other scholars oh, who no, quite happily stood to that. <laughs> so this is not the last context in which you can ask Lisa questions. Or um, So um, we'll thank her, but then you should come and join us outside for also the last uh, reception and informatic social hour of the year. So thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you.